The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. I'm Chris Beckenbach. My guest today is Peggy Apthorpe of Aging Partners. We'll be talking about fall prevention. I'm Sam Truax, and today I'll be discussing habitat gardens, environmental rewards, and personal pleasures with Dr. Ben Vogt. I'm Kristen Stowes, and today we will be talking about the mathematical approach to art with Dion Barr. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake. Did you realize that September is Turkey Month? Dick Turpin is going to be with us today, and we're going to talk turkey. Stay tuned. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hi, I'm Chris Beckenbaugh. Today we're going to discuss a serious subject, and that's fall prevention. Fall Prevention Awareness Day is September 23rd this year, and uh, in response to that, my guest today is Peggy Apthorpe. She's a staff member at Aging Partners and an expert in this area. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you. Well, tell me, what is the impact of falls on seniors? Actually, uh, Chris, it ha there's a really large impact that a lot of people I think are not aware of. Um, I think that we have a couple slides here but that will show the significance. Um, one out of every three people 65 plus falls each year. Every 15 seconds a person 65 plus is admitted to the um, emergency room for a fall related injury. and the cost of falls is very significant. By 2020, the estimated cost of fall injuries is $32.4 billion. And that's just a little more than five years away. I know, yeah. That's a significant impact. Uh -huh. So that's kind of the global impact of falls. Uh -huh. What about the personal impact? Personal impact is very significant. It can vary. Sometimes it's a minor fracture of the wrist or ankle, but uh, it could also be a major hip fracture. A head injury is something we don't often think about, but that is uh, one of the most serious consequences of falls. And especially um, in recent years, there's been more use of anticoagulants, which um, sometimes the person might be bleeding and they don't know it. It, it isn't detectable. Well, so our, for our viewers, Peggy, what, what kind of drugs are anticoagulants? What, what names would we know those by? Um, I think warfarin would be one, Coumadin. Um, those are the two that come to my mind right now. Okay. Uh -huh. And so taking those sorts of medications can have an impact. Yes. And even aspirin, although aspirin usually isn't as significant, but that is also a blood thinner. Okay. It would have an impact on the head injury, yes. Uh -huh. And then how does this impact the family? of a person who's well, had falls? Well, a, a lot of times um, what happens is a person falls and they basically lose independence and many times end up in assisted living or maybe they'll have to move in with a family member or sometimes even go to a nursing home. The other thing that can happen is they fall and then the fear of falling leads them to become, they don't want to go out anymore. They become less active, which becomes kind of a vicious cycle because exercise is really one of the most important things you can do to prevent falls. Well, speaking of exercise, uh -huh. I know that Aging Partners has partnered with Stepping On. Uh huh. Can you tell us more about Stepping On and how that will help with fall prevention? Okay, thanks to a grant from the Community Health Endowment, we were able to begin implementing Stepping On in Lincoln in May of 2013. And the program is actually called Stepping On, Building Confidence and Reducing Falls. It was developed in Australia uh, I would say 15 years ago and was brought to the United States in 2006 by the Wisconsin Institute of Healthy Aging. And um, it is a seven week program, which sounds like a long time. It's two hours a week for seven weeks. However, uh, it really goes fast and all the participants have, have said that. It goes much faster than they thought it would. There is a lot of interaction. Uh, we have guest experts who come. We have a physical therapist come to three of the sessions and teach balance and strength exercises that are specifically designed to prevent falls. 
We have a pharmacist come to one of the sessions and talk about medications and how they can impact the risk of falling. And many medications such as antidepressants, high blood pressure, pain medications, all of those can cause a dizziness which would lead to falls. We have a vision expert come and talk about glasses and vision and lighting and how all those things impact the risk of falling. And then we do, we talk about shoes, weather, assistive devices. Um, it's just a very comprehensive seven week program. Well, that might sound a, a bit a bit large for some of our uh -huh, viewers. Uh -huh. So, take me back. How how what how many different sorts of exercises are there that are taught in this program? Okay, there's really basically four strength exercises and four balance. And people start where they are. You know, everyone's at a different place in terms of what they're able to do. Mm -hmm. They may need to use a table for support or a chair for support the first time they do it. But there are four very simple um, strength exercises and four balance, okay. which I think, are those up on the, they you know, have been, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, what those look like. Um, one is called, uh, it's called nose over toes, basically. It's standing <laughs> up from a chair. Uh, there's one called sideways walking, which is really interesting because you develop the muscles in your um, upper thigh area that you don't often use, but they really help in terms of regaining balance if you fall. And those that would be something you do in church or at a movie theater. Mm -hmm. um, we have where you go up on your toes up and up on your heels. Um, just very simple exercises that we do every time. Uh, we also have the therapist talk about how to get up from a fall. That's terrific. Yeah. So anybody can start from wherever they are, exactly. whatever level of comfort or, or mobility they feel like they have now. Uh huh. Um, they can do that. And getting up from a chair, getting up from a fall. Uh huh. Those are all really critical skills to remaining independent, aren't they? They really are. Um, a lot of times people will fall and they don't really know how to get up, even when they're not injured. And it's really very simple. You turn over on your side and basically use your arms to push yourself up. But a lot of what we talk about is, uh, is simple, but it's effective. And the, the exercises as well, even though they aren't real hard, they really do help people um, improve their balance and gain strength in their lower body. And I know you shared with me that there is, there is scientific background yes. for this. Um, the evidence um, shows that 31 percent of the people who participated in this program, it reduced the risk of falling by 31 percent. That's terrific. Yeah. Okay, where could I find a stepping on program here in Lincoln? Well, we have several um, going on at any given time. We, uh, right now, we have one that started this week in Hickman. Uh, we have one starting next week at St. Mark's United Methodist Church. We have one in St. E at St. E's in October and also at Eastmont Towers. So we have offered, we've had almost 20 workshops, I believe, at various sites in the community. If they would call uh, our main number, 402, Four four one seven five seven five. We could give them information about all of the upcoming classes. It would also be in our Living Well magazine, our quarterly magazine. And is there a charge to attend these classes? Um, we ask for a three dollars suggested contribution per class that helps to cover the the cost of printing and so forth. But okay. if people can't afford to pay that, that's that's fine. So it's a uh -huh. suggested contribution. Uh -huh. Well, that sounds really affordable for just about anybody. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the rest of the program. So we've talked about the physical therapist being there and uh -huh. working on these exercises. Then the pharmacist comes in, and uh -huh. you talked about anticoagulants. Are there other drugs that they might want to well, review? Well, uh, antidepressants would be a drug that we would talk about. Sleeping pills. We spend quite a bit of time talking about sleeping pills. Um, and pain medication. Those would be, and, and sometimes blood pre pressure medication causes uh, dizziness as well. Okay, uh -huh. and then the last one was vision. Uh -huh. You have a vision specialist come in. How can your glasses impact what you well, see and how you get around? Especially if you're going up or down stairs, I think bifocals can kind of make, uh, impair your vision a little bit. 
So um, some people have just take their glasses off and be sure they're using a railing, of course, when they go up or down stairs. But vision and lighting, if you don't have good lighting in your home, you're much more apt to you know, fall because you don't see the hazards. Mm. Yeah. And then um, let's talk about shoes a little bit. Uh -huh. I think we may have a picture of a shoe. Um, what we consider to be a good shoe or a All safe right. shoe. Okay, so what I'm seeing there is they're textured on the bottom for good grip. Uh huh. And it looks like an athletic type shoe. Uh huh. So it's roomy in the front. Yes, and you want to have a beveled sole um, so that you know it. It you're less likely to slip. Um, they do recommend Velcro is good because if you have ties, sometimes you can slip on the shoestrings. Okay. But this is just one example of a good shoe. Um, there are. We bring a lot of shoes in. We have examples of safe and unsafe shoes during the program. And if you were wearing a sandal, for example, you would want to have a strap around the back. That would be one suggestion mm -hmm. there. And the lower heel, of course, is always good with good arch support. We um, also talk about the ice scrippers and things that you can do during the winter um, to reduce your risk of slipping mm -hmm. on the ice. Even uh, Oh, that's a good example there, yeah, of the ice scrippers on safe boots. We talk about one thing a lot of people weren't aware of is you can buy an ice pick for a cane. Hmm. And we do encourage people to use canes, walking sticks, and walkers if they need to. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, it's smart to use a cane. But they do have little ice grips that you can put down um, that helps uh, reduce your risk of slipping on the ice, obviously. Well, and, and something to think about, Peggy, you know, those of us who need glasses wear them. Uh huh. And those who need a walker should use it. Yeah, uh huh. And, and uh, not let pride get in the way of being safe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of canes that are quite uh, designer canes now with <laughs> flowers and all different colors and so forth. And so those might be a good idea for anyone. And a walking stick as well, you know, that kind of helps support. Well, September 23rd is Fall Prevention Awareness Day, uh -huh. and so we want to encourage all of our viewers to really think about how they can prevent falls in their own life and their family members and, and loved ones, how they can help them prevent falls. Exactly. Yes, it's the um, seventh annual Fall Prevention Awareness Day. So that's, I think it was developed because people are beginning to realize just how significant falls are and the fact that you really can do things to prevent them. Well, stepping on is a big part of Living Well's program. Are there other things that you offer, just really quickly? Uh, one of the more popular ones we have is Tai Chi for balance and fall prevention. And we started some Tai Chi classes today at the Ald Center. We also have one called STEADY, which stands for Stopping Elderly Accident, Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries. Real simple balance uh, tests that it's done very quickly. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it gives people information they can use to improve their balance. We will be doing that on November 13th at our fitness center at 233 South 10th. Um, we also have one called Remembering When Fire and Fall Prevention for Older Adults that is another short program with eight messages about fire prevention and eight about fall prevention. And um, we also can do home visits with that one. And Great. we're doing that with Lincoln Fire and Rescue. Terrific. Uh -huh. So 402-471-7575. 441. 441. Yeah. 402-441-7575. And there's all kinds of information. Yes. Living Well Magazine uh -huh. will have a whole article on this. Yes. And mm -hmm. lots of resources available. Exactly. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh -huh. Peggy, it's been great to have you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn. I'm Sam Truax, and today my guest on Live and Learn is Dr. Ben Vogt, who will tell us the benefits of having a habitat garden instead of or as part of our traditional yards and gardens. Uh, tell us what a habitat garden is, Dr. Volt. Habitat garden would be something that is created in your landscape to benefit wildlife like birds and, and butterflies and, and, and all kinds of different animals that we like to see in our gardens. And most of the time it's composed of native plants so, they can attract a, so that it can attract a wider diversity of, of insects and mammals and birds. So that means you would incorporate 
the, some berry bushes or some grass seeds or things like particular plants that yeah, well, that make the habitat. Yeah, the, the, the key to the habitat is to have diverse structure. So tall trees, medium trees, short trees, shrubs, grasses, flowers, just, you know, to have all kinds of different layers so you're supporting all kinds of different animals at the same time. And, and water. And water. Yeah, and water. Yeah, water. Yeah. Well, habitat gardens have been receiving a great deal of attention. Hey, there you go. A great deal of attention. Uh, this month I read four different articles on their importance. They're, they're, well, they are. They are incredibly important. I mean, not only to sustainability issues like uh, mitigating our water use. You know, a couple of years ago, we used up so much water irrigating our lawns that the Platte River ran dry. So when you can have drought-tolerant native plants instead, you're, you're helping, you know, cur curb that water loss and draining the rivers. Um, but also, you know, kids today are going to be seeing 35% fewer butterflies than their parents did 40 years ago. So we're losing wildlife, and we don't have to be. Yes. And and importantly, there's been a drastic reduction in pollinators, I understand, from you. So, yeah, pollinators well, and... Yeah, the monarch butterfly, you know, has certainly been big in the news. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and honeybees and native bees, you know, monarch yes, butterflies yeah. are at their lowest numbers recently, so... Well, that decrease in uh, pollinators and butterflies and other wildlife species is attributed to, by some, to the monoculture crop areas and, and in the use of insecticides. So that decreases the habitat, even though that's crop beneficial, it decreases the habitat in the rural areas. You know, a lot of those monocultures, the corn and the soybean, a lot yeah. of that's going to ethanol production, a lot of that's going to feed cattle. So, you know, it's not, even, even the food thing about that isn't really benefiting us a lot, but, but Nebraska is one of the leading states uh, getting rid of grasslands and prairies and converting yeah. it to the monocultures for crops like corn and soybeans. Yes, and the, urban areas might be more important for habitat then than those monoculture areas really well absolutely you know when you get people moving into a city and suburbs and they start planting trees and flowers yep. you know if that stuff doesn't exist out in crop fields then of yes. course suddenly our our backyards become really important to helping wildlife well most people in the urban areas kind of uh, cultivate the um, the cool season grasses and trimmed foliage and and flowers from the nursery doesn't that actually assist, isn't that enough habitat for birds and animals and insects well, well you know our, our backyards tend to be really small our front yards too you know a lot of people who live especially in an urban link and more downtown their lots are even smaller than, than people who are living out in the suburbs so just one, I mean, just one backyard can, can, can mean a lot when it's not in lawn, but then when you start to connect them and you're connecting 10, 20, hundreds and thousands, then you're doing a lot of really good and you're making up for that lack that we have in agricultural fields. Yes, one, one of the articles that I read this month was advocating planting native attractant plants around your vegetable garden because it increases the production so much. Oh, there are all kinds of native bees who, you know, well, there, there are native bees that can, well, honeybees can't, can't pollinate strawberries and blueberries nearly as efficiently as a lot of native bees. And one of the big native bee poster children is bumblebees. They have that buzz pollination that vibrates the pollen out, out of the flower. So they're doing a lot better job of pollinating uh, fruits and vegetables. You get higher, higher fruit yield and vegetable yield, higher quality yield on those fruits and vegetables. So yeah, if you get those native plants around your vegetable garden, definitely so going to be helping out your, your veggies. Detract the pollinators. Well, I had a, a neighbor whose yard grew up into spring blooming native flowers every spring. And they'd come back every year without fertilization or watering or mowing or planting, you know. and. It was really colorful when they were blooming, a real nice yard, but the neighbors every year, some of the neighbors complained that it wasn't a traditional looking yard and it was more than six inches high and all that. Do, do the Habitat Gardens in Lincoln have some problems uh, complying with standards here? I all? think they're always going to have a problem complying with standards because we have this idea that a, a beautiful landscape is mostly lawn. Yes. But, and, and, it, and it can be beautiful for some people, that's certainly true, but it's not as helpful for wildlife. Right. And so the trick is when you're putting in the habitat garden, 
think about grouping your plants together, putting them in drifts, you know, having three and five together so it looks a little bit more formal and designed um, instead of just having it more like a wild prairie look because then people will think it's well, unkempt and weedy. Again, again, just because they're native plants doesn't mean they aren't very attractive. We have some pictures coming on while we're talking here that show the, how attractive some of those gardens can be. So when one does a habitat plan, can it be designed for a specific species? Well, it absolutely can be designed for a specific species, though you're going to get more benefit when you're designing for all kinds of different oh. species, right? But you know, if you think about the monarch butterfly again that we just talked about, um, there are certainly plants that it must have and then it prefers to have. It has to have milkweed to lay its eggs on for the caterpillars to grow. So anything in the Asclepius family, the milkweed family, is what they need to just complete their life cycle. But then there are plants they like to nectar on. A lot of asters they love to nectar on. There's some liatris they really seem to enjoy. And so there's just, yeah, all kinds of plants that you can use to attract specific insects. That, that, is, that is one thing that, again, I'd like to, you to point out the fact that asters are a good native type of plant, and so are uh, coneflowers, purple coneflowers, for example, and sunflowers. So you don't give up having flowers in your yard just because you have native habitat. Yeah, and, and the trick is always to have succession blooming so that you always have something yeah. blooming at all times, something in, something in May, something in June, July, August, all the way to October. So. And the cool thing about asters is, you know, there are some native bees that can only, that only use pollen from certain species of asters to feed their young back in the nest. So yep. without asters, we'd lose some of our native bees. Yep, yep. Well, is it possible to start a habitat garden in the fall when the plants and plantings, uh, not the equipment, are not as readily available as they are in the spring? Or, and how would a fall garden go? <laughs> Fall is the best time to plant a garden. So many people look at me and be like, oh, you're kidding, it's spring. But no, it's fall because temperatures are cooler, which is makes it easier for, y for you to garden and it makes it easier for the plants to, to transition into their new home. And then they have the whole winter to spread their roots out and get adjusted, get acclimated. And so you'll almost be planting a year ahead because they'll be really ready to go next year and to bloom and, and attract all those insects and birds that you want to see. Go. And there are places they can get the plants too still. It's not as prevalent as it was in the spring, but. Yeah, well, Nebraska Statewood Arboretum is having some great there sales coming up. There you go. Well, are there places where folks can see examples of native plantings and uh, habitat gardens? Yeah, there's a couple really cool places. Uh, Pioneers Park Nature Center is, is a good place. They have a nice bio swale and then some native plant gardens around their building. Union Plaza, north of O Street. Yeah. Uh, there's a rain garden at Fireworks Restaurant on the southeast side of town that's really beautiful. And then uh, Tyrell Park on the northeast side of town has a nice, really huge rain garden with tons of native plants in it. Yeah, East, East Campus, I understand, has, has an area, too, they could look at. Yeah. But I, we visited the Sunken Gardens recently, and, and it was a very beautiful place. But my comment was, where are all the butterflies that I see in my weed garden, you know, in my... No, so there was less actual insect activity there in that beautiful garden than there is in a more native habitat. Well, you know, a lot of a lot of insects have spent thousands and thousands thousands of years co-evolving with native yes. plants. So, like in the sunken gardens, there are some native plants, but most of them mm. aren't. So the insects don't recognize them, either the pollen, the nectar, or the leaves. So they can't raise their young on them. Well, there's a, there's a good there's a good point, and I know that you've helped uh, people develop and design uh, their habitat gardens. What do folks generally want to accomplish when they plant a habitat garden? See more butterflies. More butterflies, they the want more one. wildlife. Butterflies huh? and yeah, they may be helping the bees and, and not, low maintenance too. They're not just, yeah, they're not just worried about water conservation. They want to see the butterflies. Yeah. Yeah, that's, You'll see that's more, good. you'll see more. That's good. Well, I would like to emphasize the need for establishing habitat in for where pollinators and uh, and wildlife can propagate because the habitat is decreasing so substantially in the rural areas. Nebraska lost 54,000 acres of habitat in 2012 in conversion to cropland. So the urban areas can do a great deal to offset the loss of that habitat. I would like to thank our guest, Dr. Ben Vogt of Monarch Gardens for telling us about habitat gardening. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn.
Welcome to I Mean It. I'm Kristen Stowes, and I am so pleased to welcome back Dion Barr, founder of Barr Vermeer Hacker Architects here in Lincoln, and the creator of all of this wonderful art you see behind us. Welcome back, Dion. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good to have you here. Let's get right into this. What is the golden mean? Well, it is a proportion and a number that relates to a proportion. Sometimes it's called the golden mean, sometimes it's called the golden proportion or the golden rectangle, but this represents a golden mean. And what this means is if this side would measure out to be one, this side would be 1.618, which is the number phi, which is this number, it's an irrational number that never repeats a sequence. And that is a, uh, something that is found everywhere that you look, in nature, in music, in sculpture, in architecture. All these things are, uh, deal with the golden mean. This is a nautilus shell. The progression of this spiral is this number. Same way with this seed head from a sunflower, there are two di uh, spirals, one going this direction, one going that direction. And if you count the seeds and divide one into the other, you get this number. Same way with something like a, a pine cone. If you just watch and look down both directions and count those and multiply one and the other, you get this magic number. Um, a ma the man that runs the Hubble Space Laboratory says that this number, which is phi, or the golden mean number, is the most astonishing number in the world. The, the, the sky, the, um, if you look at a tornado or a hurricane and look at the eye of a hurricane, or if you look at spiral galaxies, that's all related to this number. That's about the end. That's amazing. I have to tell our viewers that YouTube has many inspirational videos on the golden mean. If they just put in the golden mean on YouTube, they will come up with hours of entertainment on these very subjects and how the golden mean influences all of us without our even knowing it in a very positive manner. Is that yes, correct? Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. Uh, Dion, your exhibition has been in the City County Building, which is another important connection for you. Could you, you, you have actually said that this has kind of been a full circle moment for you. It is because uh, in 1997, this building was dedicated and I was the project architect for the building. So for me to have an exhibit in the building that was designed 17 years ago, kind of goes full circle. Absolutely, and it's no wonder that your artwork looks so perfectly placed here then. <laughs> well, it does enliven the space for it, sure. It, it does, it does. And I must also tell everyone that uh, the city building, county building, is a public space and that this space has uh, been designated as an exhibition space for Nebraska artists. So Mr. Barr's work will come down at the end of May, but there will be other artists to follow. So please check back on that. I believe uh, we will start looking at your two-dimensional artwork. Okay. So Dion, this piece is called the Fibonacci Freedom Tower. Actually, it relates to the new uh, building they are building in New York to replace the two twin towers that were, were blown up. But anyway, uh, this is a, a piece of art that hangs on the wall. It's a two-dimensional two piece. And it relates to the golden mean by way of a mathematical series that a guy by the name of Fibonacci uh, figured out in 1202. Anyway, so in that series is zero plus one equals one, one plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, five, eight, 13. So this piece is one plus one, equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five, eight, 13, 21. 
And if you divide five into eight, you get the golden mean. And that's how the, whole, the golden mean is, is represented in this painting. So we're going to... Now we'll move down to pyramid 58 degrees. This is another uh, piece of art that's uh, hung on the wall. Uh, it's a very early piece. I think I did this about 12 years ago. But it's, it's a very simple painting, but it relates, again, to the golden mean by way of the fact that this is the only rectangle that will allow you to, if you can see this square here, if you take the square plus this length, you get the golden mean. And you get the same thing in this direction. So it's a, I always tell people that I try and use the golden mean in almost all my paintings, because if I do, maybe I have less chance to make mistakes. <laughs> it looks pretty perfect. <laughs> OK, well, now we're going to run over and look move at on. Now, Dion, we will look at one of your other paintings that is from your Changeable art series, correct? Yes, I got fascinated by the fact that I could do art and allow people to change it every week if they wanted to. And this is a, called a diptych. It's two pieces. But it, it, this proportion is the golden mean. And uh, if you take this square away, you still get another golden mean. If you take that square away, you get another golden mean. And ultimately, if you keep doing that, you come up with this spiral that we see in all these pieces here. But what's kind of interesting about this is that I can actually take this apart, and we can change the way this painting looks. The miracle of Velcro. But then you see it's a nice shape there. And I take this one and. You would never tire of looking at that piece of artwork because it can always be it something can always different. It be changed. And, it, and so I've been doing a whole series of paintings that, that I can have that, that would be changeable. Now we will look at some of your three-dimensional artwork. Uh, it's interesting because after I was worked on the f pieces that hang on the wall, I got to thinking, and this piece is called Round the Corner. I got to thinking if I could make sculpture out of this by coming around the corner and changing these patterns and designs, again, I'd have a piece of art that I can take and move it different ways so that there's there's always an opportunity to see this piece uh, change many, many different ways. So another example of that is over here, this piece, which uh, is the same concept, uh, but totally different in, in design and appearance. And Dion, how do you choose your colors when you design these pieces? Well, I'm stuck on the primary colors, which are yellow, blue, and red because they're such strong colors. And my art is really very simple. Uh, however, it's very powerful as far as how you use color. I'm not afraid of color. <laughs> I love color. <laughs> well, it definitely sets off the lines of the piece. Well, the, the next step, after I did these pieces, then I got to thinking if I could just make a cube, it would even be more interesting and might offer more opportunities to change. So let's take a look at another example. Okay. Here's an example of five cubes, and each cube is identical. And because there's six sides, you can obviously change these. Each one of these is a different configuration. But uh, I call this piece uh, 24 to the fifth power because that's how many different arrangements you can make this into. And that's like 7.6 million different ways you can arrange this. So if you have this on your kitchen counter, you can change it every day and have a good, good time doing it. That's wonderful. Once I got into this, I decided that mm, it'd be fun to make them a little bigger. So we came up with uh, uh, this design that is a little bigger. That's quite a little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. So uh, again, 
I won't do it because I don't want to touch it, but you can change this and make different uh, arrangements, over 7 million different arrangements. And I've got one that's even taller than this. It's about about six foot tall. So oh my. It's fun. Well, that would make a statement in an entryway. <laughs> that, that would, for sure, yes. I love it. <laughs> now, Dion, this piece is enhanced by a mirror. Yes, uh, it's again one of the three-dimensional pieces, um, but setting it on a mirror, but with these strong angles, you can almost get lost in the, in the images that you can, can achieve. You can see many. <laughs> Our last piece is based on the phases of the moon, and I just find this particularly wonderful. Uh, if you put the moon and Google it, you're going to get all kinds of stuff. But what's really fascinating is the phases of the moon. And every 2.7 years, there is a, what they call a blue moon, which means there's two full moons in a month. This painting it illustrates that. And it starts with January 1st, ends up with December 31st. And if you'll notice, this is a little bluer. This is the blue moon. It happened on that last day of the month. It's fascinating when you look at the patterns uh, of the, the way the phases of the moon get light and dark. And every year this is different. And I've done this for two or three different years. Um, it just makes such a pleasing wall hanging. Yeah. And, and artistically, I think it's just beautiful. And yet it, it, it says something. It's, it's yeah. what happens. It's, it's much different than my other paintings, but it's something I've been fascinated with for a long time. Could you share with us what you did when your grandchildren were born that has to do with the phases of the moon? You can look on the internet and find out what the phase of the moon is for the day you were born. So what I have done is painted small uh, paintings for them showing what the moon looked like when they were born. And then when I get another grandchild, I have to do it again. But <laughs> we put them together and it's kind of a nice display. And what a lovely keepsake. Yeah, sure. I, that's a beautiful idea. Dion, I know this showing is over the end of May. So where may people access your artwork if they would like to see it? I'm represented by uh, Modern Arts Bidtown in Omaha. And I have several paintings there that you can see, or you can call me anytime. Dion, might you have one last question on your work and your philosophy? Well, after 38 years in the architectural practice, I decided that sedentary retirement was not for me. So I was, I'm very thankful to have had an opportunity to go back to school, uh, do some studies, and then create a, a new career for myself. And I've taken it pretty seriously for now 12 years and, and really enjoy what I'm doing. Well, we are thankful that you are doing that as well. Thank you for another fascinating conversation. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a lot of fun. So from Dion and myself, we want to remind you it's never too late to live and learn. And we mean it. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and did you know that September is Turkey Month? We have one of the biggest turkeys in the state <laughs> with us today. You all know Dick Turpin, a 42-year worker at the Nebraska Game and Parks Park, Commission, yeah, yeah. and but you're still with us, and you're still on yeah, turkey, yeah, right? Still Dick? able to take solids <laughs> and get around a little bit. Yeah, so I'm yeah. still here, kid. Yeah, still here. Well, now when were turkeys introduced into Nebraska? You know, it, it, that's been a kind of actually Nebraska's got it's a, it's a fairy tale story about turkeys because when they I think it was 1958. They got some turkeys from Wyoming. We traded them something. I forget. We traded them some prairie chickens. We got some, we got some we got some turkeys, and there weren't that many. 25 birds in total or something. Turned them loose in the Pine Ridge, and you know I think it was either 61. I think it was 61 or 62. We had our first turkey season for guy. You know, 
That's only like you, three you, years. Well, there were no was, turkeys in Nebraska no, prior no, no. to that? No, they, no, they had been, see, historically. And some people had tried. They'd buy these eastern farmyard raised wild turkeys, but they just never seemed to expand or anything. They always wound up in somebody's barnyard, you know. They, they were pretty well domesticated. And uh, so it just didn't work. But the Merriam turkey was the one everybody kind of wanted to see go. And so that's what they put in up in the Pine Ridge, and boy, they took off. Well, you then, mean like take, took off? They, breed, I mean, number, they, they took oh, out yeah, of Pine Ridge oh, or they're no, breeding? They took off out of Pine Ridge, too. <laughs> they came down the Nine Bear River drainage. Yeah. It's and, an uh, odd-looking but beautifully colored bird. Yeah, they're kind of ugly. At one, you look at them once, they look ugly. All those waddles on them, you know. Mm -hmm. And that thing that hangs down over their beak, that red waddly-looking thing, that's called a snood. It's what that's called on the toms. The toms are darker than the hens, and of course they're quite a little bit bigger. And their, head, their heads change color, like this turkey here, he's kind of a blue. They'll turn a white, hmm. I mean just a shiny white where that blue is. And that'll turn red too, also like the wattles are in there when they're displaying. You know, that's just a fancy deal for the hens, I suppose, I don't know. Dick, can yeah. you only hunt in September for turkeys? No, 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 this is the fall season, September, okay. October, November. But, right. but the spring season, which seems to be the more popular of the two, is, is for toms or bearded turkeys because some of the hens actually have beards. So if you see a turkey out there, it's got a, a beard. A female is growing a yes, beard? Yes, yes. Well, I've known a few women it's, who... There you are. Them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, the turkeys, they do that. And it's a pretty... It's not that uncommon huh. to have a bearded hen. I killed one one time. <laughs> and that's the only one I had. The cutest little thing, you know, when I got her all dressed and ready for the oven. She was just this little round, plump guy that was just a pretty... Pretty bird for the stove. Well, think about the time back in the 1950s and 60s when you're hunting turkeys and the changes in technology. Oh, yeah. Tell us oh, about yeah. what they can do now as opposed to what they did back then. Well, back then, here, here's, the, here's the difference. Back then, uh, when you went out to, to set up for your turkey hunt, you know, a lot of guys were afraid of the call. We're going to talk about calls here. Okay. But they didn't want to carry the call. Well, the call is the secret to a spring hunt. That's what do you mean how you, they didn't want to carry Well, they didn't even want to call. They didn't even want to squawk it, afraid they'd scare the turkeys. Oh. And so they wouldn't carry them. Well, we had to actually pass a law in those first turkey seasons, those spring seasons. We had to pass a law that said that you have to carry a turkey call. Otherwise, they wouldn't carry them because they, they didn't want to use them. Mm. Well, that's now that's changed all around. Now yeah. the calling has just gotten to be actually putting her overdone. People just think they have to be just this perfect turkey caller. Yeah. Let me tell you something about turkey calling. We have calls here and we'll demonstrate them and talk about them. But turkey calling, that Tom Turkey, when he's in the mood and they're breeding, I'll give you an example. Larry Porter here in town, who used to write for the World Herald, he and a friend of his were out hunting one morning and his friend belonged to the rescue unit. And Larry and him got out in their blind, they knew there were turkeys, they called and they called and they called and nothing, nothing. For like an hour, they sat in that blind and called. Well, at like 7.30 or something, 6.30, 7.30 in the morning, they have a check on those on those pagers, on those rescue unit guys. Mm -hmm. This guy's pager went off. Tee-doo, 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 you know. Three Tom turkeys gobbled back. <laughs> well, there you are. Okay. So you really got to be a good call. But I was thinking more in terms no, of no, the I'm, guns. Yeah, in yeah, terms yeah. Of, oh, yeah. You know, when you guys were starting out with bows and arrows and guns, you didn't have yeah. the scopes and the sights. Yeah. And the, oh, yeah. Well, the technology and all that has come along, I yeah. mean, as far as that goes. But loads for turkeys, you know, now they mix the shot size. So you have oh. some bigger shot and smaller shot. And, 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 they, and they, uh, the, as far as the hunting apparel... The camouflage and everything, you know, boy, howdy, they're really going for camouflage. Well, you can see here, well, that's, we're setting up there a blind and we got it kind of, you can see how we got it kind of blended You know, and it's difficult in. to tell you, the hunter, yeah. from the tent, from And I don't everything. have on the camouflage pants, I just got on the coat. So that, but, but the camouflage is important now. I mean, everything's camouflage. The guns are camouflage. We didn't have blinds back then either. You just sat down by a tree. And to tell you the truth, that's still a pretty good way to hunt turkeys. Just sat down by a tree. But, but you, need a de you need a decoy, don't you? Well, you don't need one. Because you don't need to, one? No, no, listen. I'll tell you something about Tom Turkeys. When they're out there in the wild and they hear that call, they can come to the dime you're standing on. Now, here we're setting up a decoy, and the decoys are a help because when they get up to you, they're, they're distracted by that decoy. What? And so they're not looking at you or for movement around them. 
So if you were just sitting out there by a tree, the decoy would really help you. When you're in a blind, it's not near that important, but it's still, it'll draw those birds right up to you. And I generally try to set that decoy about maybe 15 yards out because what that tom turkey will do when he comes to it, he'll strut around it. Uh -huh. And when he struts around it, when he comes because in. Because it's a girl decoy? That's right. You're and, kidding. No, no, that's what it is. Oh, yeah. That's what I use. Now, you use some tom decoys, and they'll come in once in a while try to fight them. But I've had them come in to see a tom decoy and turn and run. So <laughs> and I got to thinking over when I was a young kid going to dances, you know, <laughs> you, 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 you didn't want to go to a dance to fight. I didn't. I was going to try to find a girl to dance with, you know. And so that's the way I look at turkey hunt. Find well, the girl that wants to dance. You don't? put a little little perfume or a little well, smell little, good on the on the eyelashes on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And try to make the call sound real sexy, though. Know? Yeah. So so a decoy does help you because it distracts. <laughs> okay. But now yeah. with regards to all that that decoy, do, do you make those or do you buy a decoy? Do buy them. There's another one. Oh. Of technologies. They take de decoys like that and they can, they make a mold actually off of a live bird. And then they take that mold and they blow this fiber into it, and that's what makes it so it's got feathers. You know, it's got all the feather graduations and everything in it. They make them so they look like they can lay eggs. Now, do you need some warm clothing? Uh, well, in the, in the spring of the year, in the, not, not right now, it won't be so bad, but in the spring of the year, some of those mornings are pretty chilly. So when you go out to hunt, you want to layer up, you know. You want to have something that you can take off and... And, uh, and put back on in case you get chilly. You know, that to me seems particularly dangerous because you're still blending into the woods with the camouflage right. that my, uh, another good, hunter... Listen, good point. And I always did this when we gave turkey seminars. I said, you remember this. Camouflage is vital to a turkey hunter. Setting still is more vital, but camouflage is one of the more important parts because turkeys absolutely don't see it. Hmm. I have, I've had turkeys walk right up mm -hmm. and literally stick their head out and look over my toes. I could have kicked him in the chin because they don't know what you are because they can't see mm, the camouflage. Uh, they can't pick it out. And if yeah. you sit still, they'll do that. But you want to remember this, and I try to make this very important. Neither can the hunter. Uh, yes. He don't see the camouflage ooh, either. Ooh. And I don't know how many times we've had people that threw up a hand like this to wave to another hunter or something, <gasps> and the guy shot, oh. shot, shot the kid's arm and hand because he thought it was a turkey's head. Oh God! Here sits this round blob under this tree, and this yeah. thing comes up, yeah. and it looks to him it's silhouetted. It looks dark. He just shoots, thinking he shot the head of the turkey. Are there any women who are going out? Or yes, you women? know that's kind of important because there are a lot of girls taking up this hunting deal. I mean, you're you're getting pink guns down, pink <laughs> bows. That's the truth. Yeah, you're getting she got pink a big guns, one. The, this gal here, uh, her name is Zoe Kaywood, and she's I just talked to her day before yesterday. They come up every spring. Her and Zoe. Uh, Zoe and, uh, and uh, oh gosh. How soon they forget. <laughs> yeah, how soon I forget their name. But Zoe and her friend come up, their friend of mine, she comes up. And they, they hunt, they're turkey hunters. I mean, they're avid. There they are right there. Phyllis Spears, the girl on the left. And uh, we come up here and hunt every year. They were up this spring, killed a couple Is turkeys. there a limit to the kind of number that you can catch? I think now shoot? you can buy three permits. Oh. You can have three, three birds. But they, they're not pigs about that. They generally just come up and hunt one, you know, and we have a good time. They'll spend four or five days, camp out. They got a little camper. So we have a good time hunting turkeys. So would you consider but Nebraska a good turkey oh, hunting state? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh. We pay host to a lot of non-resident people here in this state turkey hunting. Uh, do you go on farmers' farms? Oh, farm? yeah. I mean, would you oh, get yeah. permission? Just, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You, yeah, you yeah. just go over there and say, yep. can I yep. shoot up your yard? That's right. Yep. And the, you know, the good part about turkey hunting in the spring of the year is that you don't have to have much land. If you've got some guy's got 40 acres, like where my cabin is, i got 40 acres. That's all I need. Because all around me, there's oh. timber and fields and everything. And when those turkeys hear that call, you can call turkeys for at least a mile mm -hmm. away that could hear you, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're you're when you get, when you got that call advantage, you're covering a lot of ground, kid. A lot of ground. Is there a limit to the catch, the number of turkeys? Well, you can three. Get? You can have three oh, birds. Three. Yeah, yeah. One permits one bird. You can, but you can buy three permits, so you can have three permits. Now I know, Dick, you've been involved in making sure young people learn how to shoot yep. correctly. Yep. So you want to just mention yeah. the the program with regard to the turkeys? Well. They, the hunter education program pretty well covers all that as far as firearm safety. This young kid here went through that program. You see he's got 
one of my Dick Turpin calls in his hand. He called that turkey in by himself. He's and calling Dick, oh, yeah. Dick, Dick Turpin, Turpin called Turpin, Dick, yeah. Turpin, Dick Turpin. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so he was tickled to death, so he took that picture his dad did and sent it to him, and I always kind of kept it around. He's a good kid. God, he's big and gross. He's probably married by now. <laughs> All yeah. right, we got to look at Okay. we got to listen to this, these callers. Yeah, this is what I make right here. I make a box call, make them out of walnut, and uh, I soak them in a, in a, I coat them in a deal that Stradivarius used on his violins. <laughs> did I tell you that? It, no, it, but you will. I'm, I'm going to. It was uh, the bottom out of whiskey kegs, you know, that slurry that comes out of those whiskey kegs? Yeah. You know how when you buy those barrels, whiskey barrels in a hardware store and you buy them for flower pots, how hard and black they are inside? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the whiskey stuff he used, Stradivarius did, on his violins. And then he used either turkey blood or red wine to get the stain. Now, stain on this don't matter much because it's a dark wood. But his woods were real light, so he wanted that reddish brown color. So that's what he used for stain. And the other thing he used is rendered out rabbit manure. Now I'm going to tell you, that's that, that could have been a divorce at my house. <laughs> the first time I brought home a bucket full of rabbit manure and told the missus, I'm going to cook this. <laughs> she said, not on my stove. <laughs> but anyway, I took it out in the back and I rendered it out in that bucket. I poured water in and started boiling it. You cannot believe how that rabbit manure swells up. I bet you... I took the fire scoop out of the fireplace, the scoop, and I sat out in the backyard and I just kept throwing that rabbit manure out of that bucket as it swelled up. I'll bet you I threw out five times. I'll bet you I threw out 25 gallons of that rabbit manure. Well, because manure. it smelled so bad? Oh, it smells terrible, <laughs> yeah. But, and that's why my wife didn't want anything to do with it. But when I got it boiled out, when it rendered out, then I put it in a big jar, a big gallon glass jar, because uh. I wanted to see what, I didn't know what it did, what color it was. And I wanted to see the color and what, you know, so I rendered it through a, through a diaper, a muslin, muslin diaper, mm -hmm. three times. Third time it come really clear, just a little stain in it. But the jar was just clear and the most beautiful amber color. And it didn't smell at all. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. It was a perfume you put on oh, the top Oh, I couldn't it. believe it. I told my wife, come get, uh, smell this yeah. jar. She's not on your line. We've just got a few but, seconds okay. left, so why not let's But these the are sound. just a friction call. <laughs> and, that's, and you can make several. And who, are you, who are you calling with that? Hen turkey. A hen. That's hen. a hen. That's a hen turkey sound. Now this call here is the one I make out of the inside of this. And it's a striker call. It's littler. A lot of guys like these because you can stick in your pocket. But it's a... And this one, this, this here, you, a lot of... Uh, traditionally you use chalk on these calls to get the friction. I use pine sap. I boil my own pine sap. And I make that and I put it in a little wooden, looks like a pool cue chalker. Uh -huh. And I just chip a little out on the lid and rub it in and that, that's what I use for friction. This here I saved, it's out of the middle of this call. This is a deer call. When those deer are, are rutting, they grunt and that's what this is. My mother-in-law said it sounded like a bullfrog. It does. <laughs> but that's the way those deer sound. So I made a... So when, when you're turkey hunting, you take all these No, along, not this. Or this you, is just deer hunting. You, you these just, two here. I, yeah. I don't mean, I mean yeah. turkey hunting. Yeah. You take, take them all along just oh, yeah. in case? Just a couple of calls because a lot of times you'll be calling at that bird and he won't answer. You pick up another call and stroke it once and he'll be just like the deal the, with the pager. Yeah. When he heard that different sound, he gobbled yeah, three come. of them. So, yeah, you're ready to come running. <laughs> so a lot of times it's a different pitch and everything. But the ladies that okay. haven't tried this need to talk their husbands into going with them because they'll get... Well, they don't have to talk their husbands to go. They can just go out by themselves. Well, they're going to have to get a start. Oh, well, I'm going to show well, them how to call and stuff. <laughs> and then they can go out yeah. by themselves. Dick Turpin, of course, uh, formerly retired. Thank you for having years me. years for the Game and Park yes, Commission. And it, always a pleasure. Me too. Thank you. And how many are you going to get this year? I'm just going to probably just shoot one. Oh, okay, just I, shoot one. I'm not going to be involved, <laughs> right. yeah. Remember, <laughs> it's never too late to live and learn to hunt turkeys. I'm Harlan Johnson, and you know, I was surprised to learn that the senior centers have been around Lincoln for 40 years. They started in 1974, and Bob Esquivel is my guest today. He's the senior coordinator for the centers. And so, Bob, you've got a lot of things planned for the uh, coming month of September. 
You bet. September is going to be our big anniversary for our 40th. Uh, we've been celebrating in an open door since 1974. Uh, the, we, as you asked uh, earlier, the fine art of experience is one of those things. We're going to have a big opening for that on the first Friday, which is Friday, September the 5th from 5 to 7 p.m. This is going to be an art show that's going to feature the work of artists over the age of 65 who will be doing portraits of other artists over the age of 65. And it's going to be a, a wonderful opening that night with some entertainment and, uh, and some refreshments and, uh, of course, some wonderful art. And also, back in the 70s, uh, you know, Big Red was rolling big in those days. Uh, tailgating was big. Now, tell us about the tailgate memories. Okay. 1970s Tailgate Memories, that's going to be a fundraiser for our senior centers. We're going to be doing it out at the Playmore Ballroom, which is at 6600 West O. We're going to be featuring two wonderful performers who've been in our area for quite some time, Johnny Ray Gomez and Jimmy Mack, who've been kind enough to get on board with us to do this celebration. We're going to have a lot of uh, raffle drawings that evening, uh, again, some great music. Uh, hors d'oeuvres and our sponsors I want to make sure that I mention because you know you, you need a lot of help when you're doing things like this. Uh, our gold sponsors the Re Legacy Retirement Communities, Silver Sponsor Billy's Restaurant and our bronze sponsors Horizons, Horizon Com Hospice Community Foundation. That was hard to trip out of my tongue there. Um, and our other bronze sponsor Home Instead Senior Care. It's going to be a photo booth, a whole lot of fun that night. Now brain matters, that's important. It's a health fair what the, what's all that about? I can't remember. No, no, that's not true. No, uh, you know, as we age, you know, we all, oh, realize, yeah, yeah. we all realize we start to worry more about, about our mental acuity and about our memory and our brain function. This is our second annual event of this type where we're going to have a couple of speakers talking about some important aspects of that and a vendor fair that's going to feature booths from businesses and organizations locally that, that have a lot to do with this very issue. It's going to be out at the uh, Marcus Edgewood Cinema, 56th and Highway 2. Our speakers are going to be Dr. Alley, who you've uh, probably heard of, I know our, our viewing audience has. Uh, she's going to be Dr. Alley Daring, there we go, and also Don McKenna. Dr. Alley is going to be talking about uh, the potential memory issues with drug interactions. And Don McKenna is going to be talking about the, the value and the positive effects of meditation on uh, brain acuity. So um, we're looking forward to that. And if you want to uh, sign up for that, we, we do need you, although it's free, we do need you to call because there's limited seating at the theater. And you can call 441-6156 to make your reservation for that. Now, the next one includes a couple of very familiar Lincolnites, John Roth, Mary Jane Nielsen talking about history. That's right. That's, those are the kind of folks you go to when you want to know more about what went on in the 1970s. And of course, because that's our, our focus on this Open Doors in 74, we're going to be doing a luncheon that will feature those two with some wonderful nostalgic photographs of Lincoln in the 1970s in the disco decade. In fact, that's what we call it, Lincoln in the disco decade. And uh, the main dish that day is going to be something that's as old as I am. Back in 1949, the Runza restaurant started their first restaurants. And so they're going to be catering our, our main course. We'll have some additional foods along with that. But uh, it's a great program. They, of course, have done lots of books like Looking Back, uh, Lincoln, uh, A Street Called O, When I Was a Kid in Lincoln, those, those kinds of books. They're going to be there to do a, a look and a discussion and some, some uh, memories about nostalgia, a nostalgic look back at the 1970s here in Lincoln. Now that's September 25th, and where is that? And that's going to be at the Firefighters Reception Hall at uh, 241 Victory Lane. Okay. You know, September is actually Senior Center's month, and of course it takes a lot of planning, and you've done a lot of planning for some interesting things. Uh, thanks, Bob, for coming yeah. and being on the Live and Learn I, Show. I do want to mention okay, yeah, that if you that. want a more detailed look at all the things that we're going to be doing during the month of September to celebrate our 40th anniversary, get your Living Well magazine out, look at page 18, and all the, all the items I've discussed here are going to be there, but in a much more detailed way. Thanks, Bob, for coming and being on Live and Learn. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn.